you put the uh, left throttle in afterburner range, and you go one potato, two potato, three potato, and pull the throttle back that much, that much. That's perfect right there. And then you just modulate with the right to throttle. But what I did before I learned this, and Rich Graham is the one who told me this, bless his heart, it was at Kadena. And I would say, Rich, I'm really having a tough time lighting the burner on the boom. Every time I do a little bit of weight and stuff, I always got my fuel, but I didn't like it. It was uneasy. Well, what are you doing with the throttle? He says, well, I put the throttle and then I see, no, no, you know, there's a, there's a technique for that. So I, I didn't learn that until I was already qualified, mission qualified at Kadena. But after that, it was, it worked out really well. So after that, yeah. Good. Just, just can you just talk a little bit about that then? The, the visibility, the the combing, the fact that in the SI you've got a. I don't know if it's really visible to you flying oh, it, yeah. but there is a pillar or whatever in between, right, looking down the middle of where you would you would look if you were looking forwards. Yeah, the the, the windows are like this, and uh, they put the bar in the middle. No, you just you just look around it. Uh, F one hundred six, F one hundred two, that's the same same thing. Do you do you end up? not being cognizant of it after time or do you always notice it it didn't bother it never bothered me because there's there's enough out there that you can see without worrying about this little bar here and if you want to look around it just go like that Um, no it didn't didn't bother me at all and and bc before you continue with the narrative of the mission uh, you mentioned that once you were full you didn't want to pull more than a g and a half Uh, what was it that made the airplane sort of uncomfortable with, with anything more than that what was what was going on well you're close to stall if you try to pull more than that because you, you you we're we're not and this is starting up not not in acceleration because acceleration we're at 400 450 knots equivalent airspeed but uh, it's just the airplane is just uh, delicate i say the best word for it is just delicate at that at that time when you need to take off when you disconnect from the boom to the full load of gas what, what, the, the reason why the g is there is because of structural limits what were the normal g, g limits uh, it depends on the fuel load and whether you're maneuvering or not, and the uh, the distribution of the fuel. So the uh, the, uh, the uh, center of gravity. I don't know what all that stuff is. I mean, it's 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 a there's a chart on it. But my rule of thumb is you never pull more than two Gs ever. And uh, we also had a pitch boundary indicator that told us when we got close to a limit. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily a G limit. It wasn't, but it was uh, AOA. And so the, the two are related, of course. You pull more Gs, you get more AOA. It was a, a, a shaker, or I'm no, sorry, it was a yeah a shaker. First thing you get was a shaker, which would be a non-centric motor attached to the control stick. It's rattle, rattle, you could hear the rattle. And if you went farther than that, and it was based on either the AOA or the rate of approaching the high AOA, then it would take the control away from the pilot and push your nose down. It was that critical that you not not get close to a stall. So you'd be flying along, and I felt it a couple of times. Boom, boom, it goes like that. And there's no no doubt what's what's going on. You check everything, okay. There was a famous story of a crew doing a air show at Toronto, and they were they were on their way back to Beale, so they were like 45, 50,000 pounds of gas on the airplane. And they were trying to do an air show like they did when they came back. <laughs> and the guy got into pusher, you know, 45 degree bank turn close to the ground and it, it uh, the airplane disappeared <laughs> for a while the wing commander was there watching it and he, he briefed us all on it we all were uh, admonished that you, know, you fly that airplane it's not a fighter airplane it looks like one but it's not one you don't uh, you don't yank and bank that airplane. you on the on the, the subject of the kc-135 so this would have been a kc-135q so that's a yeah. special variant of it dedicated to the the sr-71 uh, what, I mean, you flew them, so I'll ask you the question. What else was different about the Q model? The Q model was made for the SR-71, but if they had extra Q models, I guess, because I flew one over in, over in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. It was it had, a, it had a, a supplement to the flight manual that told, I was a co-pilot, that told the co-pilot how to refuel with the thing. But the only thing different was that it, it had the ability to segregate the tanks that was for the SR, the JP-7 fuel, from the other fuel. So you, you certainly don't want to mix those two fuels and then give it to the SR. So they had a way that they could. But other than that, it was just a normal tanker. Uh, it might have had, it probably had the classified, the control head for the classified radio taken out. I don't remember seeing anything unusual about it. I've flown in the queue uh, to watch other guys refuel, you know, just for fun or for edification and fun. I, I don't know anything. And we used, we flew in the tanker when we, uh, if we didn't fly the SR to Okinawa, which of course was a big, big, uh, big deal. 
Uh, then we flew in the tanker and uh, to Okinawa, and that's how we got back back and forth for our TDYs. Usually it was by the tanker. And the tanker was also used as a cargo airplane to carry all sorts of stuff. It was usually loaded down. So, so b- before you pick up then on the uh, on this, on the story of the mission, uh, the, that refueling was done at what sort of speed then? It, it would, uh, yeah, the, the, the tanker, I think, uh, speed limit was 350 uh, indicated or calibrated. And uh, we f- flew about 365. They had a dispensation to go a little bit above their limit, about 365. All right. So after the tank, then uh, we run the checklist and, and then uh, start the uh, Axel. We had an Axel checklist. Put the engines into a pan afterburner, make sure everything works, and then nice, gently put them up to full afterburner. Again, check the engine instrument. And now we're looking for 450 knots or 500 knots. 450 usually, just to have, so we wouldn't be at the limit, and start a climb up to 30,000 feet. Or was it 35? Yeah, 35,000. And at 35,000 at uh, 450 knots, we'd be right around 0.9 something, 9.3 or 9.4. And then to uh, to go through the Mach, because that's a high speed or high drag region, to go through Mach 1, to punch through that uh, bow wave. We would then start what we call dips doodle, but it, it would just lower the nose to about 10 degrees nose nose low. And I, I would I would lower it kind of slowly, it put it on about maybe uh, 0.6 G, come down so it got light in my seat a little bit. And then that allowed the airplane to start accelerating and then go down to about 10 degrees nose low, and then the airplane starts accelerating because you're using uh, using gravity to help you. And then you would bottom out about 30,000 feet at, uh, you'd be supersonic at that time. And then you maintain your 450 knots equivalent airspeed all the way up until about Mach 1.6, where you have to uh, bleed, I forgot what it was, 10 knots for every one tenth of a knot, Mach number. So anyway, you had uh, the autopilot would do that for you or on the checklist that told you what speed you should have it. Any particular altitude. I used to have that memorized, but I don't remember what all the speeds were now. Uh, and then we had all sorts of checks. We had lots of checklists uh, monitoring. The main thing we monitor is uh, inlet guide vanes and speed, of course, Mach, fuel, center of gravity, and uh, the inlet. And then the inlet starts scheduling about 1.7 Mach or so. And uh, the bike, you see the, the pointy thing out the engine, retracts. It tracks 26 inches. So at Mach 3.2, it's all the way back at 26 inches. And if the spike, the spike is, the position is pretty critical. If you get get off, you can get an unstart, which I'll describe later if you like, or uh, you can lose gas. If the spike is too far forward, if it's a half an inch too far forward, that could mean the end of the, of the mission fuel-wise. You wouldn't know it for a while, but it, it will. Your, your fuel curve would start going down. So then once you get to level, now your dynamic pressure is now around 340, maybe 330 knots, equivalent airspeed. But your Mach uh, is Mach 3, and your true airspeed is 1,800 or so. If you want to push it up uh, more than that, you want to go to Mach 3.2. Was the maximum Mach on the flight manual that you're supposed to go is Mach 3.3. We would cruise at 3.2, giving us a little bit of pad uh, just for that reason. So you have pad, but you could always go that extra tent if you wanted to, assuming that you're staying within the temperature limits. How high are you at this point? Well, you'd level off about 73,000, and then as the fuel burns up, then you'd be above 80. Or you could go right to 80 if you want to, but you wouldn't be at optimum altitude. We, we always flew at optimum altitude for the power setting and for the gross weight and the outside air temperature. So we had a a checklist that would take all three of those variables into consideration and tell you what altitude is best for you to be. And uh, I would always you know, strive for that altitude. The autopilot did not have altitude hold on it. So it, the only thing you could do is uh, to set an attitude hold. And one particular attitude would usually be okay to follow the he's bleed schedule because the higher you go, the, the uh, you have to uh, go at a lower dynamic pressure because you're at a higher temperature, and that's for structural reasons. So your uh, your speed limit, I've, I've been asking, you know, hey, what's the hot, fastest it can go? Well, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question, because I don't think anyone would be foolish enough at 80,000 feet to go to full power and just see what happens. Yeah, that's pretty stupid. I never, ever, and I don't think anybody else, well, maybe one guy, <laughs> intentionally uh, broke any speed limits or any limit on the airplane. There's just no reason to. If I break the limit and the next guy breaks the limit and the next guy breaks the limit, then the airplane is not the same airplane. It's not the airplane that the that maintenance has promised it will be for the third or fourth guy. Because all of these limits are not absolute brick walls. They're all 
probability statements. So like the uh, limit, the usual, the first limit that we would hit would be the compressor inlet temperature of 427 degrees centigrade, which is 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And this 427 sounds funny, it was because it's 800 degrees Fahrenheit and then the gauge is in centigrade. So if you hit that limit, then you're supposed to stop. And, and usually we would hit that around Mach 3 point. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10 hit subscribe and get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.